الله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله أما بعد عباد الله اعلموا أن أصدق الحديث كلام الله وخير الهدي هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم والشر الأمور محتثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم وما يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We praise him, we seek his help and we ask for his forgiveness Whomever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides, no one can lead astray and whomever he leads astray, no one can guide We bear witness that no one has the right to be worshipped but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and he has no partner and that Muhammad alayhi salatu salam is a slave and messenger. Allahumma salli alayhi wa ala al-muhajirin wa al-ansar wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsan wa lam yugayir wa lam yubaddil ila yawm al-deen. Fashionably late. Alhamdulillah. You know, you can tell the success of the community by how long it takes to turn into Hammersley. If on Friday it takes a very long time, alhamdulillah, the community is doing a very, very great job. Alhamdulillah, I see a lot of familiar faces and some not so familiar faces. If you don't know who I am, my name is Islam. I was raised in this community. Uh, a few years ago, I moved for school and then work. So I've been around. But every time I come back, it feels like I'm home. And every time I'm here, it's like I'm with family. This community is the community that raised me. I see people that I've known since I've had memories. People that I've seen, Sheikh Rashid. And that, you know, I have dreams about that adhan. We have such a blessed community, and alhamdulillah, I always feel very grateful for the opportunity to stand in front of you and, you know, give as much as I have. And even if that's a little, inshallah, if there's one ounce of khair, then I'm content. And we, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because just a week ago, we were in his blessed month. And he gave us the opportunity to fast therein, to pray therein, to come to the masjid, to see our brothers praying side by side. And this is yani shay azim. It's something grand, it's something great. It's not something to be taken lightly. And every single one of us is fighting for the spot to make it to the next Ramadan. Whether you know it or not. Because there's only a certain number of spots, a certain a lot, allotted number of people that will be allowed to see the next month of Ramadan. And if we're going to live for one thing, if we're going to survive in this dunya for one thing, it's to see the next Ramadan. You know, there is a hadith in Musa Imam Ahmad. Talha bin Ubaidullah, he said, I had a dream. And in this dream, I saw two amongst the Muhajireen. One of them, he died a shaheed, he died a martyr. And the other one, he died a year or so after him. And in my dream, I saw Jannah. And I saw the one who died after him enter into Jannah before the shaheed. Talha said, I was shocked. I was surprised. Because we know the status of the shaheed. We know the status in the eyes of Allah of the one who dies a shaheed. But the one who died after him entered into Jannah first. So he went to the Prophet ﷺ and he told him of this dream. The Prophet ﷺ, he responded by saying, 
أَلَيْسَ قَدْ صَامَ رَمَضَانَ بَعْدَهَ Didn't he fast a month of Ramadan after him? And prayed a year's worth of prayers after him? Yani he had the opportunity to raise his status in the eyes of Allah because he was given one more opportunity to claim Laylatul Qadr, to claim the status of Ramadan, to fast therein, to make adhkar therein, to recite Quran therein. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to witness the next Ramadan just so that we could achieve his mercy. And you know, during one of the khatiras in the last 10 nights, our brother, brother Mustafa, he gave a khatira and he said that Ramadan is like a, a training ground. And I really like that analogy. He said, it's like a training camp because everything is set up for your success in Ramadan. You know, the shayateen are locked up. You're in the masjid almost every day. You're praying, you're fasting. And why are we doing all this? What is the hadaf? What is the goal of Ramadan? It's taqwa. I know I wasn't here before Ramadan, but I know Sheikh Al-Hajj. And I know in his khutab and his halaqat, he talked a lot about taqwa. Yani if you're gonna get one thing out of Ramadan, let it be taqwa. Let it be God consciousness. Constant, the constant fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the thing that we should be, we strive for through Ramadan and we seek in Ramadan. And if you want to know how to maintain taqwa, you should know what the opposite of taqwa is, right? But what is the opposite of taqwa? If taqwa means God consciousness, then the obvious answer is, the, ob the, the opposite is ghafla. Ghafla. What is ghafla? Ghafla is heedlessness, neglectfulness, forgetfulness, complacency. These are all synonyms for what ghafla means. But I think it's better described with examples, anecdotes. So we'll start off easy. It'll be a personal example. You know, your mom calls you and she says, Islam, take out the chicken so when I come back home from the freezer, so when I come back home I can make dinner. And I forget. And she comes home and she's like, where's the chicken? Oops. That's a softball. I'm sure some of you have had similar experience. That's a softball because the stakes are low, you know. No pun intended. But the stakes are low because you, you, it's just, dinner is gonna be late an hour or two. It is what it is. Let's get a closer example. You're about to leave to go somewhere and I tell you, listen, there was just icy rain, so be careful when you're driving because the roads are slippery. And you go on the belt line and you drive 100 miles per hour. What do you think is gonna happen? You were heedless, I gave you the warning. I told you, it's icy rain, the roads are icy, be careful or you'll get in an accident. And you get in an accident, why? You were heedless. I gave you the warning and you didn't take it. Now things are more serious because that's life and death. That's like 100 miles in the butt line, that can cause serious, serious repercussions, not just to your own bodily safety, but somebody else. But the best example, and the most accurate example for what heedlessness is, is the example given to us by the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet, he was describing the relationship between him ﷺ and the Ummah, his people, his nation, and he said, it's like there's a huge fire in the middle of the night. And your insects flying toward the fire thinking it's light. And I'm trying to wave you away. I'm trying to wave you away from this fire and you're just going in head first. That's the best example. 
That is the best example of heedlessness. But you might say, but Islam, like if I'm walking toward a fire, I'm gonna see the fire before I get burned, aren't I? I'm gonna see the fire when it starts getting a little warm. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He answers. He says, وَلَقَدْ ذَرَأْنَا لِجَهَنَّمَا or فِي جَهَنَّمَا كَثِيرًا مِنَ الْجِنِّ وَالْإِنسِ We have destined hellfire as the abode for many of the jinn and humanity. Why? لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ بِهَا They have hearts that do not contemplate. وَلَهُمْ أَعْيُنٍ لَا يُبْسِرُونَ بِهَا And they have eyes that they don't see with. وَلَهُمْ آذَانٌ لَا يَسْمَعُونَ بِهَا And they have ears that they don't listen with. إِنْهُمْ إِلَّا كَالْأَنْعَامِ بَلْ هُمْ أَضَلْ Indeed, these are like cattle. Nay, they are more misguided. These are like sheep. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no. They're more misguided. These are the ones that are heedless. You have all these facilities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided you for one thing and one thing only. And that one thing is to recognize the reality. Is to recognize the reality. And the reality is that this is this dunya is just mata'al ghurur this dunya is just it, it, it's, it's here to trick you to make you see things and hear things and do things that are not in your best interest they're not and the, he, the heedlessness that one follows it's derived from a few different sources you know it's I know it's scary because you get caught up in dunya, right? You know, you have to feed your family, you're worried about your kids, you're worried about your social life. You wanna get married, you wanna have a job, you wanna buy an Audi. Everybody has different life goals, and it's fine. But there's a difference. There's a difference between the energy we give dunya and the energy we give akhirah, right? Because the energy we give dunya, we understand it's just a necessity. It's something you have to do because you're alive. But the energy you akhirah, it's something special. Because you know that there are billions of people contemporaneously on this earth not giving that energy there. Not giving the energy an akhirah. They're being heedless. And the first group are just ignorant. They don't know any better. They don't know Jannah, Jahannam. They don't know Akhirah. They don't know these things. Unfortunately, none of us fall in this category. It's 2023. Nobody can claim ignorance. I'm sorry. And if you could claim it, now I ruined it for you. Because I brought it to your attention. What's, what's the second group? The second group is just pure complacency. And this is the trick of shaitan. You know, when you start having thoughts like, man, I'm in my 20s. I have all the time in the world to be a good Muslim. I have all the time in the world to pray. I have all the time. You know, once I get married, then I'll be a good Muslim. And then you get married. And you say to yourself, no, no, once I have kids, then I'll really focus on my deen. And you have kids. And then for some people, well, I have to it gets to the point where they don't even need an excuse. They don't even give themselves an excuse to be heedless. It's just their status quo. Thinking that, no, there will come a time, I have plenty of life to live, there will come a time where I gather my, you know, my thoughts together, and I'll go for it. اقتربَ للناس حسابهم اقتربَ للناس حسابهم وهم في غفلة معرضون. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is telling you that your reckoning it's approaching. It's approaching you. And you're what? في غفلة معرضون. 
You're in heedlessness turning away. It's like a truck is coming at you full speed and you decide I'm just gonna turn this way and it's such a beautiful day outside. Let me look at the sun and the trees. And a truck is speeding towards you. We have all these reminders that it's coming, it's coming. Be prepared. Prepare yourselves, it's coming. Because when it comes, it comes. When it comes, it's over. When it comes, it's over. There's no do-overs. There's no do-overs. And for those who are not successful, they'll say, قَالُوا لَوْ كُنَّا نَسْمَعُ أَوْ نَاقِلْ مَا كُنَّا فِي أَصْحَابِ السَّعِيرِ If only we listened, or we just contemplated, we just thought, just, we just put a little thought into it. And you know, it's not just something that's unique to Muslims. It's not something unique to Islam. I forget what it's called, but there was a, a theorem in logic saying that if there is a chance, if there is a chance that there is a creator, if there is a chance, no matter how minuscule it is, that heaven and hell are real, then it makes absolutely no sense for a person not to prepare for heaven and hell. Because the stakes, you're talking about an eternity. A hundred years versus an eternity. That's the dangers of heedlessness. That's the dangers of this ghafla. And you'd find in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He talks about it constantly. And He talks about the people who would end up in hellfire. And they wouldn't say, I didn't know. They wouldn't say, I had no idea this was coming. But they, were, they would say, I was heedless of it. I was, inna kunna ghafilun. That we were heedless. We let our, la our lives pass us by until it was too late. That's what they would say. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He talks about the people who weren't heedless. And He describes them by what their priorities were. If their priorities were dunya, they're heedless. Subhanallah. There's never an example when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, oh, they were, they, they were with dunya, but they went to Jannah. No. Whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the people who were successful, they're the ones that turned away from dunya. They recognized akhirah. And I'm not saying that we all have to become monks. Everybody pick a mountain, go on your mountain and pray 24. That's not what I'm saying. But if you wake up and you think dunya, and you go to sleep and you think dunya, and all throughout the day, you're only putting your chips in dunya, what else, what are you, what else are you leaving, le what's left? What's left for akhirah? There's nothing left. So that's the second group. Those who are just purely complacent. They think that they're going to live forever. And that's the, that's the trick of shaitan. And the third group, wallahi, it's the scariest group. And it's the group that you would find Americans to be in, especially American youth. And you have American Muslim youth that are following in this category. And those are the people who are willfully heedless. You know, subhanAllah. The, the Shaykh told me about a week ago, I think, that, you know, this is your chance to give the khutbah. If you want it, take it. And I said, you know, Allah barakatillah. Yesterday, I'm writing up this khutbah. Or at least I'm thinking about what I want to talk about. I feel like it's better. I don't like having notes and having papers in front of me because I can't. The connection isn't there. It's just words being spoken. So I'm thinking about all the points I want to make and the trajectory I want to go. And I take a break. And I go on my phone. I'm on social media. And I see this content creator, this sister. Her, her page says like Islamic content or Islamic advice. That's what, it, that's what it said. And you know what her advice was? This, this post had a few hundred thousand or million uh, this is around probably 2 million views and 100,000 likes, something like that. 
And she said, don't live your life. This is to Muslims. This is a Muslim sister who makes advice for Muslim youth on her social media page. And her advice to the Muslim youth was don't live your life in fear of going to hell. That was her advice. Don't live your life as if you're afraid of going to hell or in fear of going to hell. You know what the comments said? That's the first thing you do. You go to the comments. What are people, how are people reacting to this? Because I know how I was reacting. I was astonished. You know, that's not even the right word. I was mortified. I was disgusted because of how much traction this got. How many people saw this? You don't need a degree to be on social media. You don't need any certification. Anybody can just go and say what they want to say. So I went to the comments and I was hoping, hoping that the people in the comments were like, no, this is not right. You shouldn't say this. You shouldn't do this. I go to the comments and all I see is, sister, this is exactly what I needed to hear. This is, I needed this. Yani, what more do I have to say? This is, this is willful he heedlessness. The Prophet said we're going to follow in the footsteps of the people before us, right? Ahlul Kitab. This is like the savior complex to the max. You know, Allah is the most forgiving, so do what you want. Do what you want. Live your life how you want. That's the message she was trying to get across. You know, she said, and she quoted, she, she nitpicked just one ayah in the Quran. Left the rest of that, she just took one ayah that, said, that's talk, that talks about the people who believe and do righteous deeds. The people who believe and do righteous deeds, you're going to Jannah. So she said, if you believe, and you, she didn't even say do righteous de deeds. She said, if you try your best to do righteous deeds, that, that's her tafsir, you're going to Jannah. This is a little off topic, but parents, we, you have to be aware. You have to be conscious of what your children are internalizing. If you don't have a relationship with your children, you're gonna have a problem. If your children aren't in the masjid, you're gonna have a problem. Because if Sheikh Al-Hajj isn't their Sheikh, they live in Madison, and Sheikh Al-Hajj isn't their Sheikh, they're gonna find a Sheikh. They're going to find Sheikh Islamic videos 2942. And they're going to give them all their Islam and we'll see what kind of Muslims we bring up. I saw, I saw a statistic also very recently, within the last week, a statistic of the practicing Muslims, people who self-qualify as practicing. After every generation, there's a huge drop off. You have the first generation. Most of the people are still practicing. Second generation, huge drop off. That would mean my kids. Third generation, it's like 12%. It's like 12% self-qualify as practicing. It's scary. It's scary. They probably still call themselves Muslim too. They're, I'm Muslim, you know, my, my grandfather came here from, from Lebanon or wherever. And I'm Muslim, I go for Eid prayer, I look all nice, I wear my best, my watch, my Rolex, and I go, and that's my Islam. It's tough. Ikhwan, if, you, if we want to raise a good Muslim community, we can't, we can't tackle all of America, I'm sorry. It's too big. You put America in front of like, in the space of other countries, it's like all of Europe, it's too big. Let's just focus on Madison. If we want a strong Muslim community in Madison, it starts at home. If your kids don't see you going to the masjid, I promise you they're not gonna go to the masjid. Yahdi Allah man yasha, of course. But if they don't see the examples at home, they don't have anything to take. If they don't see you praying, what's, gonna, what's going to lead them to prayer? If they don't see you giving sadaqah, if they don't see you doing these good things, 
Yani the heedlessness, not only are you encompassing it, but now your kids are inheriting it from you. It's scary stuff. It's, it's very, it's, well, it's, it's earth shattering. And I have conversations with people about stuff like this, and well, sometimes people are too optimistic. I like to be an optimist too. I like looking at best case scenario and being happy about the good that we achieve. Alhamdulillah, we're raising so much for the masjid where, where we've, we've gotten so far, but we shouldn't turn a blind eye to reality, right? We should be very aware of reality. And this is the reality that we're in. And I don't know how long I've been going. You know, I'm very rusty. I haven't given a khutbah in, in quite a while. So I think أَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَاسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهِ لِي وَلَكُمْ فَاسْتَغْفِرُوا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين very, very heavy stuff. I'm sorry. I, I usually come up and whatever I have to say, I just let it go. Forgive me. Any mistakes I made, they're from me. And any good, it comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Now, we have some sort of groundwork to work with. We understand the gravity of ghafla, the gravity of heedlessness, the gravity of of not encompassing Islam in our daily lives. We understand that Ramadan made it very easy to encompass Islam in our daily lives. Ramadan made it easy to have taqwa throughout the day. And after Ramadan, things get tough. You go back to reality. You go back to work. You know, you, you, you give yourself more excuses than you would during Ramadan? What are some basic strategies that we can take to make sure that outside of Ramadan, because you know, Ramadan is like you enter a store, very nice store, jewelry, you know, cars, whatever you want, and you're looking around, you're like, mashallah, this is all so beautiful. And then Ramadan ends, and I tell you, you have to get out. But you can take one thing, you're in the store, has all, this, all these cool things, and I tell you, okay, you gotta go, but take one thing. What are you gonna do? You're gonna look at the most, you're gonna try to find the most valuable thing you can find, grab it and run. The most valuable thing you can grab and you can take from Ramadan is taqwa. You grab it and you take it out. Until the next time you see it, you hope that you still have the taqwa. You, you would hope that you still have it. In order to maintain this taqwa and to stay away from ghafla, there's a few things we have to do. Number one, you have to hold yourself accountable. You can't give yourself excuses. You have to look at the mirror and say, which group am I in? Am I from the muttaqeen? Do I have taqwa? Or am I being complacent? Am I praying? Am I doing? Everybody knows themselves. Don't lie to yourself. We do that a lot. It's easy to lie to yourself when you keep yourself busy. Take a moment, a time, dedicate it today, tomorrow, and look at yourself in the mirror and say, how am I doing? Give yourself a rating. If you know you have room to improve, alhamdulillah, that's the first step, recognizing it. Number two is making the intention. Because some people, they might be like in the third group, where they're like, yeah, man, I am not doing great. I'm not doing great, but you know, it is what it is. YOLO, you only live once. Some people are gonna be like that. We wanna make sure that we have the intention after we recognize that there's an issue, there's a problem, we have the intention to make something good out of it. To get better, to do better, to be better. That's number two. And number three is changing the conditions that we're in. إِنَّ سَفِينَةَ لَا تَجْرِي عَلَى الْيَابَسِي 
a, a, a boat, it doesn't sail on land. That's a saying in Arabic. What does it mean? It means if you're in a situation, if you're in a, in, in a certain context, brother, I swear, if you tell me you want to lose weight, and I see you go to the grocery store and, grocery store and buy a chocolate cake, I'm going to have some doubt in you. Do you really want to lose, lose weight? You tell me, oh, Islam, I've really been trying. And I see you at McDonald's, I'm gonna be like, okay. You have to ch change the conditions that you're in. Whatever that means for you as an individual. To set yourself up for success. And sometimes it can be just a small change. Coming to the masjid. How far do you live from the masjid? 10, 15 minutes? If you come to the masjid daily, once, Fazr, Isa, do your pick. I promise you, I promise you, the amount of taqwa you have will go up. Because you're going to be in a masjid, the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with other Muslims praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala daily. Daily. And that's just one 10 minute car ride. 30 minute bus ride, whatever it is. It's a very small investment, but the, the rewards you reap are a lot. And I understand people have different circumstances. You, as long as you're being honest with yourself, you're in a better position than I am. You know, if I could, I would sit here after and we could go over it one by one, every person, but I don't have that kind of time. No, I'm just kidding. If you wanna talk to me, by all means. So changing your conditions is necessary. It's necessary. And lastly, it's building habits. Building good habits. We all know the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha. That Allah loves the actions that are done habitually. But you know why? actions that are done in habit are so powerful because it doesn't take an effort to do something that is your habit. You don't have to make the conscious decision every time you want to do it, to do it. It's a cheat code. If you had every time, let's say you've been praying for five years, you'd never miss a prayer, ever. You always wake up for Fajr. If you had to, every time you decided that you were going to pray, you had to sit there and think about, am I gonna pray or am I not gonna pray? And then make the decision, no, I'm gonna pray. If you had to do that every time, wallah, you'd slip. But you don't. Any person who prays regularly, he will tell you you don't. You hear the adhan, you get up, it's clockwork. That's why the actions done habitually are so powerful. So building, good habits, building habits that allow you to recognize Islam in your life. And if all the habits you have are bad, and you have no habits that remind you of Islam throughout the day, then, you know, be warned. Be warned. That is ghafla. That is being heedless. And I don't like, you know, standing from a place of privilege. Because I'm a person just like everybody else. I have my own issues. I commit my own sins. So I don't want it to come off as self-righteous. But I'm warning you and I'm warning myself. The Prophet ﷺ, one time he gave a khutbah and all he was repeating was أَنذَرْتُكُمْ النَّارِ أَنذَرْتُكُمْ النَّارِ I'm warning you of hellfire. I'm warning you of hellfire. And they said his voice got so loud that the people in the marketplace, they could hear him continuously saying this. It's not something that can be understated. It's not something that can be worn out. It's something that we have to be cognizant of. Something that we have to remember. Something that we can't be heedless about. And the opposite of that, of course, is taqwa. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among the muttaqeen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us. 
We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to witness Ramadan. Allahumma hadina fi man hadayt. Wa'afina fi man afayt. Wa tawallana fi man tawallayt. Wa qina wa sirf anna sharra ma qadayt. Fa inna ka taqdi wa la yuqta alayk. Inna hu la yu'izzu man adayt. Wa la yudillu man walayt. Tabarakta rabbana wa ta'alayt. Ibad Allah. Inna Allah ya'mur bil adli wal ihsani wa ita'id al qurba. Wa yanha anil fahshai wal munkari wal baghi. يعيدكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروا الله يذكركم واشكروه على نعمه يزدكم ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون قموا إلى صلاة رحمكم الله